Hello, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. It is good to see you here. And today we are talking about the embodied gospel. The embodied gospel. Now, <clears throat> gospel is one of those words where people think people th it's a buzzword and people Im import a whole bunch of ideas into the buzzword of gospel. And they have this static idea that the gospel is always this one fixed thing. And the Bible does not operate that way. In the Bible, the word gospel just means good news. See, none of the writers of the Bible were writing in service to any kind of systematic theological idea such as this or such as this. None of them are writing in service to that. There is no unified theory of gospel or justification or redemption per se and then every time the god like a bible writer an author of scripture uses that word it's in service to the unified theory that they somehow all have in mind but never bothered to tell anybody and then we have to figure it out post hoc like the laws of physics we call them laws of physics but they're actually should probably be called consistent observations of physics because there aren't any laws, we just it just seems that we've discovered a certain way that things operate. And we think that there is this overarching way, overarching set of thoughts for all these words, these buzzwords that we find in Scripture. And gospel is one of those. Ruckman has some good points on the word gospel. He shows in context that it means ten different things. In Scripture, for example, the Gospel could refer to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the you know, Luke, John. In the Book of Luke, the word Gospel is used in uh, Luke chapter nine. They're going around preaching the Gospel, and then in Luke chapter eighteen, verses thirty-one through thirty-four, right around there, it's very clear that the apostles who were preaching the Gospel back in chapter nine have no idea about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which Paul later says is the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. What does that mean? The word gospel just means good news. And the good news is limited to the context in which it is used. That's very important to understand. Okay. So gospel is a huge big idea. And when we're told to preach the gospel to every creature, it's probably a good idea that we understand what that means. Or, or are we told to preach the gospel to every creature? Was somebody else told that? I'm not saying we aren't. I'm just saying that it's a good question to ask. Okay, And that's what biblical interpretation should be. Should be about asking the right questions. Okay. If you enjoy the content you get here, please consider supporting the channel. We uh, love providing the content. And if ever comes a time when it seems like there aren't enough people enjoying it or benefiting from it, we will stop producing it. I don't think we're anywhere near there. We do seem to be growing in the amount. Just got a message from somebody the other day and they said, uh, please more growth. All it was, the real short message, please more growth and transformation content. <laughs> Some... Some people are like, stop doing that stuff. You're backslidden, new age, Gnostic, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, go back to the Calvinism stuff. And frankly, that doesn't interest me, nor do I think it's in your best interest. And then these other comments are like, hey, I'm getting a lot out of this growth and transformation content. Please keep doing it. You get a lot of messages like that. And that's very, very encouraging. I appreciate that. If you can support the channel, if you want to see more of this, uh, thanks to you who do, it takes a lot of time, space, resources, uh, and money to put this content together. So if you appreciate it, we, we appreciate you. <clears throat> and if not, you know, the wrath of God and all that, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's a lot of people who they're doing everything they can and you're welcome to just want you to know that it takes effort to put this out. And if you enjoy it, bear that in mind. So the gospel, as we move forward, it's very important to understand that we've done some videos on the, con on the concepts that we're talking about today 
One of them is the name of Jesus and fractal salvation. For what we're talking about today, it's very important. It's very helpful if you have that under your belt already. If you don't have that under your belt, I highly recommend you can watch this video, but I highly recommend that you go watch that one before making any comments or asking any questions because there's a lot of prerequisite information that we've already covered. Also, another video, which was more recent than that, just a couple weeks ago, we did one called Growing Beyond Beliefs, all right? And we're not against beliefs. What we're saying is, but the problem with fundamentalism in Christianity and evangelicalism in general is we, t we act like getting people to the point of beliefs is the end goal. Once we get them to affirm certain fact claims, then we've accomplished our duty of preaching the gospel to every creature and we've persuaded these people to buy into it and that's kind of like kind of like the stopping point. Now I know we all agree that oh no, we believe in Christian growth beyond that. I know I know you say that. But we also understand there's a lot of people who turn out to be what we would call false converts or duds or they fizzle out or they wind up they promote Christ for a long time and then wind up saying this isn't for me. You have people like Megan Phelps, Derek Webb, Paul Maxwell, Josh Harris. Uh, you know, the list could go on and on of people who were once fervent, ardent public supporters of what would be considered mainstream Christianity by many people or close enough to it to where some people would say they're saved. And then they come out and say, no, this isn't the thing. We're doing something wrong. And just getting people to be persuaded or ideologically possessed to affirm a fact claim is not salvation. Okay. It's very important to understand. James said, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils believe also. The devils also believe and tremble. Okay. So just believing the fact claim and having the facts right doesn't save a person and isn't I also need to push the pause button and say, as we talk today, do, do not be thinking about, if you're thinking about salvation in a linear dualistic sense, like we all grew up with it, you're saved at a certain point and you die and go to heaven and there's either eternal security, there's not eternal security and it's not by works, okay? I'm not speaking against any of that. I'm not speaking for any of that. All I'm trying to do is point out some other observations. We need to live the gospel. That's what today's video is about. We need to live the gospel. And I want to encourage and provoke you to love and good works and talk about how we can live the gospel. That's what I want to focus on. And don't get the idea that I'm saying if you don't live it, then you've lost it or never had or don't have salvation or anything. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not, I'm not even going there. Not trying to go there at all. I'm just trying to say that we need to live the gospel and we need to emphasize living the gospel. And I think that believing the gospel in the biblical sense included a commitment to live it out, not just mentally affirm fact claims about God and Christ and that he did certain things. <clears throat> there was a demon possessed guy who ran up in Mark chapter five and he saw Jesus afar off and he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Jesus said unto the demon, come out of the man thou unclean spirit. And he said, what is thy name? My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Nor now there was nigh unto the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding and all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into him, into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place in the sea. There were about 2000 and they choked in the sea. So demons know exactly who Jesus is. 
Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. They have, they have no questions about who God is, who Jesus is, none of that stuff. Having that stuff right does not satisfy the gospel for you. You need to live it out, not just affirm the fact claims. Okay, Even the devils believe the fact claims and tremble. The devils have all the right ontology. They got it better than we do. Okay, That's not the issue. Having the right ontology is not the issue. In Acts 19, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, evil spirit, okay? Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. The devils don't have any problem with who Jesus is. They don't have any problem with who Paul is. No problem at all. So the gospel is not about, is not about being persuaded that certain fact claims, like ontological fact claims about Jesus and the resurrection are just true and factual. It's not about that. The devils even have that. The devils even know that. We've had a guy on here, Brian Mossman, and he gave his testimony. He heard the gospel and believed that it was true, but wasn't ready to get saved, wasn't ready to commit his life to Christ. He said he wanted to wait until the end of summer and then commit his life to Christ, which at that time in his life, he did. He delayed, he delayed getting saved and then got saved later. Even though he believed all the fact claims, believed Jesus died, believed Jesus rose again, that he was the Savior, that that was the only way to pay for sin, all the things, okay? He, he believed they were all true. Just didn't receive Christ, didn't trust Christ, was the touchstones of the gospel, until later. So some people might say, well, he was saved as soon as he believed they were true. No, no. Okay. So we've got something wrong with how we do things. And I'll touch on this a little bit, but whenever there are two opposing viewpoints on a particular item, and maybe people are debating about it, okay, it's important to ask what premises do these people hold in common? And maybe the premises are wrong, okay? So James White and Layton Flowers are going to go debate in March. Uh, my buddy Jameson Haygood, who we do the radio show sometimes, we're going to go watch it. He actually paid for the tickets. He's going to swing through here and pick me up. We're going to go there. It's going to be fun. Um, on both sides. Now, Layton and James, they're both wrong. They both have the wrong framework of salvation, but they're going to debate on salvation based on ideas that are built on wrong premises. Okay. They both have, um, some idea of salvation, much like what we've talked about before. Well, all the framework that's behind me. Okay. Hebraic Megazeus, all that stuff. They both have all that in common and all of that's wrong. Okay. It'd be like if you had two physicists, and they had all these theories about, you know, astrophysics or whatever, quantum physics. And they could never they could never end the debate. And it turns out that they were both presuming that the speed of light was 12 miles per hour. That's why they're both wrong. They have two different opinions, but they're both wrong because they're based on wrong premises. Or they could argue all the same things with the premise that the speed of light is infinite and instantaneous. Now, that used to be the presumption back before about 1852. They thought the speed of light was instantaneous. They didn't know that it traveled at 186,000 miles per second or something like that. And there are some people like Rupert Sheldrake and Adam Satterfield who, who are putting forth the idea that the speed of light is not a constant. But all of our scientific assumptions right now are based on the idea that the speed of light is a constant. And then we started measuring the speed of things with a cesium-133 atom, an atomic clock, 
which vibrates at the speed of light. So if the speed of light were to speed up or slow down, you wouldn't be able to detect it because your clock is vibrating at the speed of light. So it's a rather stupid thing to measure the speed of light using a clock that uses the speed of light based on the premise that the speed of light is a constant when it might not be. So if you're calling that into question, you have a rubber ruler. And we do the same thing in theology all the time. Do the same thing in theology. We have all these assumptions about how things work and we build all this theology based on all these garbage assumptions. Now these two different theological books here, you, you always wave this one around, Wayne grew to me. You think, well, that's wrong because you need to correct the propositions to the right one. Adam Harwood's is better. They're both wrong. They're, bo they're both based on wrong pre uh, premises, both of them. And the endeavor to try to create a static set of conclusive truths from Scripture is the wrong thing to do with the Bible. It's not the right thing to do with Scripture. So it's not that... So this, this one is just as profane as the other one. You see? It's not that one's right and one's wrong. They're, they're both profane. What we want to do is we want to get rid of all that. And if you want to grow, uh, part of your ego death that you're going to need to have in order to grow and transform, part of the ego death, you're going to have to come to terms with the fact that, here's a proposition for you, okay? You need to attach yourself egoically to this proposition. I'm saying that for all you smart alecks out there. <laughs> this, this is my belief system. My, here's my ideological possession. You gotta come to, terms to fact, come to terms with the fact that studying the Bible to arrive at propositional conclusions that you think are correct is not the thing to do with the Bible. And all the things that you're holding and having mode that you think are the correct basic fundamentals that you have to at least have these things right and build on. And you're just building truth claims up from there. But nobody's living the gospel. All these people, you get all the truth claims all stacked up, look just right, just like they're supposed to. You know, people like Tyler Vela and Paul Maxwell. Paul Maxwell had John Piper convinced that, it, you know, in, in alignment with Calvinist theology that all his propositional truth claims are all stacked up correctly. Okay, it's, it's a facade. It's like a, it's like a paper castle. There's nothing there. It's a facade. And for those of you who think that swapping out the wrong propositions for correct ones is the answer, it's just a different color paper. It's still construction paper. Maybe one's blue and one's green or one's red, but it's still paper, you see? Changing the colors out doesn't change the problem that maybe you shouldn't build the castle out of paper in the first place, so, okay? And uh, going from Calvinism to provisionism is just changing the color of the construction paper. It's not remedying the problem that you can't build a castle out of paper which everyone's trying to do. And uh, here's the paper that they're using to do it with. Paper. <clears throat> Johnny in the comments section said, it's like trying to grasp a handful of water. All you do is make a mess. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. What do we want to do with the embodied gospel? We want to be reminded. Let's remind ourselves that Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, Jesus never talked about a set of truths. Now, he did talk about truths. He said things, interestingly, the people who are so upset about me not wanting to have a propositionally reductive Christianity, they'll throw this proposition out there in John 8, 24. Look, look, he said right here, unless you believe that I am he, that you will die in your sins. But they don't even believe that proposition because the he there, the antecedent to the he is the father. And they think that you have to be a modalist if you believe that verse is true. And you look at the grammar and the antecedent to the I am, he is the father. I got the little triangle diagram it says, you know, the Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's not the Son, etc. and so forth. 
and he'll realize in Isaiah 9, 6 that the Son is called the Everlasting Father. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, unless you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins. So even the people who believe that you have to have propositions in, holding, hold, in having mode uh, don't even believe the propositions that are in the Bible. They believe things contrary to them, and they believe them so ardently that if you don't agree with them, you're probably not saved. All while they run around saying sola scriptura. It's the most ridiculous, asinine thing I've ever seen in my life. What people do, <laughs> who are propositionally minded, claiming they get everything out of the Bible, and don't even accept what the Bible clearly says. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't leave us a list of truths, although he did promote certain truths. Okay, It's kind of like uh, in our video where we talked about growing beyond beliefs. It is like, say you're going to play basketball. It is true that the foul line is a certain distance from the goal and a certain distance from uh, the out of bounds line. But believing that isn't the stopping point. Believing that that's true is helpful to play the game of basketball, but doesn't get you anywhere near being a good basketball player. Matter of fact, if you had some great basketball players, you could probably reassess and move all those lines around and they could still play the game. Okay? So believing that certain things are true is the that's just the playing field that we're on. That's not the goal. That's not the end point. Getting everybody to align with that that is true is not the end state. Getting people to embody it is what's needed. He's the way. It's very clear. Jesus is referred to as the way. He's never referred to as a list of beliefs. The way, the way, the way. You see here up on the slide over and over and over again. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. And somehow we've committed idolatry by replacing Jesus with a set of beliefs. And if you affirm all the beliefs just right, you can come, you can join our group. And what you've just done is you've just denied Jesus Christ when you do that. And those of you who are doing that, you're in the middle of idolatry. You've erected a golden calf in a different form, and you've demanded everybody worship that instead of Jesus. You are the reason for the defection away from the faith. And everybody is a Derek Webb or a Paul Maxwell or a Tyler Vela or a Megan Phelps just waiting to find out because of what you are promoting. And you have no idea. And those of you who are getting a little upset in your body about what I'm saying right now, you are egoic. I also want to remind us that the Bible says very clearly, above all, above all these things put on charity. It lists a whole bunch of things in Colossians. And then tells us in chapter 3, above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. In Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt commit no... This is the same book, okay? Where Paul, in Romans chapter 3, you know what he's saying in Romans chapter 3? All that stuff, all will be guilty before God. He's basically saying the same thing that James is saying. James says it much more concisely. If... Though you follow the whole, whole law, yet offend in one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. Okay? Now, James says that very concisely. And Paul takes a whole chapter to say the same sentiment. Okay? He's a little more verbose, a little more wordy than James is. But it's the same concept. And the same guy who wrote Romans chapter 3 says, For he that loveth his brother hath fulfilled the law. Take that back to Romans chapter 3. You know what the problem with Romans chapter 3 is with people? They never read Romans 13. They never saw where Paul was going with it. And that's the problem we have. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's, that's, uh, the brief comprehension of all that together. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore 
Love is the fulfilling of the law. Same guy that wrote Romans 3 wrote that. Okay? Calvinist wants to debate you over Romans 3, take him to Romans 13, see what he says about that. Okay? Because you may not understand this, but, you know, Romans has 16 chapters in it. And when the guy is in chapter 3, maybe he's not done yet. Maybe he's getting to a point that he hasn't made yet. Maybe you need to read the rest of the book before you start writing some silly, stupid doctrine about Romans chapter 3. Are you following me? Now, the end of the commandment, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, Paul tells Timothy, now the end of the commandment, and we would say that in the military, the desired end state, what we're, what we're getting to with all of this is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. So that's the summary statement at the beginning of the book, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. And remember, Timothy, Titus, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus have the highest concentration of the word doctrine in them. Now, we believe in doctrine here. It's just not propositionally encapsulated. It's doctrine, think of the Monroe Doctrine, the Bush Doctrine, okay? The Truman Doctrine. It's a policy, principle, or procedure by which a person operates. That's what doctrine is. It's procedural, perspectival, and participatory. It is not propositional. The proposition is necessary to teach the doctrine, but the teaching of the doctrine is not the doctrine. The performance of the doctrine is the doctrine. So we believe in doctrine here, and we believe that it can be transmitted propositionally, but the propositional transmission is not the doctrine any more than the money for the house is the house, or the money for the car is the car, or the money for the groceries is the groceries, even though it can be exchanged for such, presuming everybody agrees on both sides. So propositions about doctrines can accurately transmit doctrines that are about policies, principles, or procedures if both people agree and understand that those propositions point to those things. Okay? Doctrines are not the propositions. Doctrines are the policies, principles, or procedures. We use propositions to teach the doctrines, which must be acted out. Okay? Um, and then he says, which, from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling, okay? And faith, okay, that's, uh, we don't want to do that. We want to keep charity. And Paul puts charity as greater than faith and hope at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Peter says, if you don't like Paul's word for it, Peter says, above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. And that cover a multitude of sins is not in a salvation sense, but in an interactive sense on how people get along. Thanks for the super chat from One Day. One Day says, Kevin, go easy on latent flowers. There are so many believers who need to hear how Calvinism hampers their growth. If not for your older videos, I would be nine marks. Yeah, uh, we're not uh, against latent flowers. Um, there is ample need for Vygotsky's zone of development. That's why we leave our old videos up. I've debated this for a long time about taking all the old videos down, but with Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, there are people who, because of their level of development, they still need that, okay? And that's appropriate for them. I hope they grow past that, uh, but they still need that. So thanks for the super chat. Appreciate the comment. We're not against people. God can be uh, fully adored and experienced by people at all levels of consciousness, and all levels of consciousness are valid and are needed and are valuable. Okay. In First Corinthians one twenty one, uh, in First Corinthians chapter one it says. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now, uh, those of us who are uh, in 2023, I think that would be everybody listening right now, we've, our society has come through some various different things where we've, we've come into the modern era, 
And then uh, they call that like maybe the age of the radio. And then we've gone into the postmodern era, uh, right around after World War II or so, Foucault and Derrida. And then we're getting into the metamodern cultural era, okay, where things are a little different. But the modern era, for example, is all about uh, building everything up, building the biggest building, leaving a name for yourself, leaving the legacy that was the modern era. And the I and oh, the pattern that we're going to see in the embodied gospel is order, disorder, reorder. People from the modern era do not understand that. It is absolutely foolishness to them. You just build up higher, bigger, stronger, more legendary. Make a name for yourself, okay? And so this is this would be foolishness to them. And we have this pattern over here, life, death, resurrection is the way that Christ embodied the actual gospel that we believe. He lived, a, he lived a life, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, okay? And the, the abstracted pattern of that that we am, are to embody every day is we pursue order, we encounter disorder, some kind of failure, and through that failure, we come into a reorder that is better than the previous order. Now, the way the, the wisdom of men is to avoid all failure, avoid all failure. But the wisdom of God is that through failure comes resurrection. And that resurrection is what we need. Now, in the Christian life, we, when we embody the gospel, we live that cycle of order, disorder, reorder, life, death, resurrection, over and over and over. Job, get fired, better job. Something like that, okay? But some things that are sometimes much more serious. Um, things with your kids, things with mental health, things with major failures, families coming apart, uh, diseases, okay? Uh, life, death, resurrection, it happens at every level. So the gospel, remember, the gospel is fractal. There could be life, death, resurrection cycles that are longer than your lifetime. And there could be some that take less than 10 minutes to, to play out. And throughout your life, there will probably be, probably be multiple cycles of this pattern in your life. Most people encounter a at least one major dark night of the soul. And if you attend to it properly, that could be the catalyst to get you into a major resurrection cycle and perhaps launch you into, you know, second tier consciousness. If you take someone like Mr. Miyagi from Karate Kid, Karate Kid, you have a very simple person or who he conducts, he lives a simple life is what I'm trying to say. He's a um, a repair man, maintenance man. Uh, but even though he has a lot of his life behind him, he's still willing to commit effort and energy into Danielson. And then later on in the show, you find out that he has a very sad, dark night of the soul that he went through uh, where he lost his wife. And it was the anniversary of, of uh, him and his wife, and his wife had died. And it looked like from how he was, if you would call it celebrating or mourning that situation, that he wasn't quite over it. And those who go through a death cycle in your life, life, death, resurrection, you'll see that people who have genuine wisdom, they also carry with them a sadness in their eyes. Through the dark, from the dark night of the soul that they went through. And other people see that. Danielson walks in and he sees him with the picture of his wife up there, singing songs and being sad and crying and having a drink. And Jesus came back from his resurrection cycle. Even though the resurrection cycle was over, you could still look back on the past wounds. And he showed his hands and his feet 
and how the wounds are still visible to other people. But he came out of them. And when you go through a resurrection cycle, you'll have a, you'll have a kind sadness in your eyes where you are happy and blessed and have a higher level of consciousness and you can see more clearly. But the wounds that got you there are still visible to people and it's okay to show them to people to let them see to embody the gospel to let them see the cross that you had to carry to get where you are it's okay it happens so this pattern you could call this the uh foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty the base things of the world which are despised hath God chosen yea and the things which are not to bring the not to bring to not things that are now these are all things and God hath chosen these things very conditionally it, their condition, Calvinists will try to say that, you know, this is unconditional election, but this isn't about choosing people. This is about choosing things, processes, items, encounters, foolish things of the world. And they are chosen conditionally based on the condition of being foolish, based on the condition of being weak, based on the condition of being base based on the condition of being despised. Those are the conditions on which God has chosen these things. Okay. And like God has chosen failure as the mechanism that brings about a resurrection cycle in your life. That is counterintuitive and it doesn't make sense, especially to the, to the modern mind of bigger, faster, stronger, leave a legacy, always up, 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 you know, With the, the thing from The Simpsons. Higher, higher, I forget what it says. Somebody will put it in the chat, I'm sure. Twirling, twirling, twirling. The embodied gospel, Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Well, let's back up. In 2 Corinthians 4, starting in 6, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. John 1, 9, this is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, after you get enculturated to where you can read and speak and support yourself, it's time to go back and find that light that you were born with. Okay, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. And so now we're peeling back the layers of the onion of our enculturation, our ego, so that our authentic self could shine through to people. We are troubled on every side. Why are we troubled? Order, disorder, reorder. We are troubled on every side. We are dis- yet not distressed. We know that resurrection cycle is coming. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We know that reorder cycle is coming. We are persecuted but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. We always know that resurrection cycle is coming. Bearing about in the body. Now this is the embodied gospel. Bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. The responsibility that you voluntarily adopt for the sake of yourself and for the sake of others is costly to you. And sometimes it results in failure. Then, the next part of the cycle, that the life also might be made manifest in our body. So that order, disorder, reorder. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. (coughs) Why do people have kids? You know, after somebody has kids, if you have a husband and a wife together, and they're doing fine. They both are employed, they're in good health, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Once you have a kid or two, by any metric of well-being, for most people, 
Okay, I'm sure there are exceptions to this. But for most people, by any metric of well-being, the parents are now worse off than they were before. There's new financial difficulties. There's lack of sleep. They're a little less healthy than they were. They're a little less well-rested than they were because they have kids. Now, why would they go about having kids if it's going to be taxing on their well-being? Because you get meaning from that. And you have an opportunity to cultivate something that brings about life that goes beyond you. You have kids. You can, you can make a difference to the future by that sacrifice. And you can have meaning. You can be something that matters, that has significance, that has, that has purpose, that has coherence. And it takes a sacrifice to bring that, that about. To have kids is to participate in the future by proxy. And to participate in the future requires a sacrifice of your immediate well-being. That's just one example. But any time you voluntarily adopt responsibility, you take a cost hit for it in some way. And then after that cost hit, that's the failure disorder, then there is a reorder, resurrection cycle. So this is the pattern of the embodied gospel. You bear about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus, the cost of voluntarily adopting responsibility, and then the reorder, the life, the resurrection comes about afterward as a result. That is the embodied gospel, okay? For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, and that's at every level, not just physical death of the body. But you're taking that disorder hit, order, disorder, reorder, taking that disorder hit, that death hit, that crucifixion at at an abstraction to greater and lesser degrees of severity. Of course, maybe you're not going to be put up on a cross and nailed to the cross till you die, but something like that. And it could be that, you know, cleaning your room costs you 10 minutes of your time, but then now you're much more productive. There's a resurrection cycle on the end of it. So it's fractal. It happens at every level, every layer. So when we talk about the power of Jesus for salvation, the idea that it just saves a person from sin and hell in a linear fashion after the end of their physical life that is one of the most profane and underrating things we can sell to people because Jesus can salvage at every level, at every time scale, at every level of effort, at every scale of effort. Jesus can salvage. The name of Jesus itself means Yahweh is salvation or Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is what salvages. That's what the name means. And if you look at Jehovah, Yahweh, it is a statement of being, okay? I am that I am. That's a be verb. Or some have translated that as I will be what I will be. I am that I am. I will be that I will be. Maybe what Tillich would call the ground of being. Jesus, the ground of being, is salvation, And so the gospel includes uh, to live it out means to get in touch with the ground of being, which Jesus said refers to as a way. Okay. Solomon talked about the, the heart of the king being in the hand of the Lord, like a river. Okay. And he moveth it, whether it's over, he will like a river. Heraclitus talked about reality, like a river. So being in attunement with the way that is Christ the ground of being, Jesus is that ground. He's the embodiment. He's the manifestation of the ground of being in the flesh. Okay? So we talked about that song. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What does that name do for you? It tells you that being in attunement with the ground of being is how to salvage everything. Everything. There is nothing outside the grasp of of the salvaging power of Jesus. And by the way, Jesus is in you. 
Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. Philippians 2.13, it is he which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is not some external thing that's out there that you have to go appeal to. Paul said it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That is the life of a believer. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that Christ that is in you is the salvaging power of every situation you encounter at all levels, at all scales, time and otherwise. Time, space, and otherwise. <clears throat> so for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So your mortal flesh can actually, can actually be the manifestation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ by embodying the gospel. Order, disorder, reorder. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And I think that any parent could say that to their kids and you understand that. And Paul would have a similar relationship to the people that he's working with here. Yeah, he's not doing very well. He's having the snot kicked out of him every other day. I have the passage of 2 Corinthians somewhere around here. Look, look at what Paul went through. Um, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save ones, 39 stripes. And the reason it was 39 instead of 40 is because 40, 40 was the sentence. But if you miscounted and did 41, you could get in a lot of trouble. So just to be safe, they would only do 39. Thrice I was beaten with rods. One, uh, once stoned, thrice I suffered, suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep in journeyings, often perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils by the city, in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, cold, and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So he's at just like a, a parent, uh, doing less well by the metrics of well-being for the sake of caring for their kids, Paul is undergoing this same kind of thing for the sake of the care of the churches. <clears throat> Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? I must needs glory, I will glory in the things that concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, I lie not. So Paul... That's 2 Corinthians also. Paul is leading up to this point when he says, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, death worketh in us, but life in you. We have received the same spirit according as it is written, I believe and therefore have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Now, the way I always read this from a dualistic mind, back as a fundamentalist evangelical type, was just to, you know, I'm going to physically die and then I'm going to be raised up physically one day in the future. But this is a very cyclical thing, and he goes on. This is happening throughout your lifetime over and over. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, there's your disorder, your crucifixion cycle, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And that shows that the dark night of the soul that your ego goes through is the way to discover the authentic self that Paul mentions being the one that is not sinning. In Romans chapter 7, verse 17 and verse 20, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So he separates himself, the real him, from the one that's sinning. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us 
uh, for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And your, your authentic self is built up by the failure and degradation and ego death of the ego self, of the false self. In 2 Corinthians 2, okay, Paul says we are a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. And now we've always thought of that as saved people and lost people. But we are a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, reorder, and in them that perish. People who happen to be in a disorder cycle. It could be seen both ways. To the one we are the savior of death unto death, to the other the savior of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. The next passage, some of these slides came from other presentations, so I have passages in here that I'm probably not going to get to during this presentation. This passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now listen to this. You would think, oh, he's going to raise my immortal body once at the end, at the final resurrection, the rapture, whatever. But it looks, this is again 2 Corinthians, and it looks like he has this embodied gospel cycle in mind. When he says this, who delivered us from so great a death, like what? Like all this stuff. The Jew, you know, being beat with rods and shipwreck, all that kind of stuff. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, right now it's ongoing deliverance, and in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So Paul's been delivered out of these kinds of things over and over and over again. So when he's, you know, when I was in fundamental Christian evangelicalism kind of stuff, he always, oh, this is when I got saved and doth deliver. That's my sanctification, getting me to the day of, res you know, glorification and in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And that's the way I've always interpreted the passage. That's the way I've always heard it interpreted. But I really think now I see it very differently. I see that Paul is talking about this order, disorder, reorder cycle of the embodied gospel happening over and over and over in a person's life. And we already saw 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and all the terrible things that Paul went through. Philippians 3, we have a great example of Paul's ego death. I want to call your attention to verse 10 and 11 first, so you know where it's headed. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, for all the people who are thinking of this old model of salvation, you might, oh, attain to the, re he's, Paul's working for his salvation. He's working to be saved. Nothing of the sort is going on. Nothing of the sort. It's a order, disorder, reorder cycle that he's referring to. Okay. So Paul's, and so over and over again, he's going to suffer, be made conformable into Christ's death in an abstract and less severe way, except one time he is stoned and left for dead in Acts 14. So what did Paul go through? He was a super religious, very egoically super religious person in Philippians chapter 3. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man, any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee. And he doesn't use Pharisee in a bad connotation like we do today, but somebody who actually followed every jot and tittle of the law uh, as best as they could figure they could. 
concerning zeal, persecuting the church, is touching righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now that's that cycle coming up. You would, all this gave Paul a lot of prestige, okay? It's like, uh, it's like walking around in America with, you know, a couple million dollars in your pocket. You, and, and having some kind of clout and recognized status, maybe celebrity status, something like that, where you could pretty much get anything done that you wanted to. You had a lot of respect. You had a lot of position. You had a respected education. And what's he say? What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord. And this is not this knowledge of Christ my Lord. This is not this kind of nonsense. Okay? Not this. He's talking about participatory knowledge. Okay? Like I would talk about knowledge of my wife Paula. You better believe that I am not talking about a list of things that I believe about Paula. I'm talking about, inter, you know, memories of interactive experiences with her over the course of years. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Count them but nothing, dung, okay? And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's talking about that embodied gospel. Give up all the things and count it as all but loss, as all but dung. Okay? Not as though I had already attained, nor either were already made perfect. Okay? So he's like, look, I'm not just because somebody's past stage three doesn't mean that they've arrived. We've all got work to do. And just because I'm beyond where I used to be doesn't mean I, I you know, I think that I've arrived and I'm already made perfect. We continue striving, we continue pressing for the mark. We all have a mark to continue pressing toward. But I follow after that, I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do Forgetting those things which are behind, okay, all your 12 semesters of Greek and all your Hebrew classes and all, all the beliefs and all that nonsense that you have, all your religion all stacked up and piled up, forget all that. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. So be followers together of me for what? All this stuff that you built up, your seminary education, your ordination as a pastor, all that stuff is part of your ego. And it must die that you may win Christ. I'm not talking about that you can get saved and da -da -da and have eternal life. I'm talking about embodied gospel. The order, disorder, reorder to actually be manifesting in your mortal flesh. Okay? That the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in your mortal flesh. That's what Paul's talking about in Philippians 3 that I may win Christ. Be followers of me so that the life also of Jesus can be manifest in your mortal flesh. That's what Paul's talking about. Be followers together of me. Mark them which walk so of us as ye have for an example. Get rid of all the stuff. Forget all the things which are behind and move forward, press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Embody the gospel. In Romans 12, there's a very famous passage which you're very familiar with. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Put yourself proverbially up on the cross, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For now, I want to compare something with you. There's a phrase in verse 3 which says, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And the passage here says, I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And the typical way of handling this is very left hemisphere. They will say, well, that every man there is just a reference to those that are among you. But what we forget is that the chapter divisions that we see in our Bibles are not in the original manuscripts, okay? Those weren't added until like the 1200s by a guy named Stephen Langdon. And even then, they've been changed around a few times depending on what version you get, okay? The Bible never had chapter and verse divisions in it uh, like we have today. So when Paul says, I beseech you therefore, the therefore is a reference to what he just got through saying in Romans chapter 11, Okay, In Romans chapter 11, we should probably look at the whole chapter, but for the sake of time. He's talking and he says, for, for as ye in times past, ye Gentiles in times past, have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, the unbelief of the Jews. Even so have these also now not believed, the Jews have not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Isn't that interesting? Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And that, that's not, Calvinists always quote this as an excuse to, pack, to affirm contradictions, okay? And contradictions isn't what this has in mind, okay? What this has in mind is what happened right here. The same failure of the Jews is the prompting of the Gentiles to believe, Romans 10, 19, Deuteronomy 32, 21, and the same Gentiles believing is the prompting of the Jews to receive their mercy and believe. God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And the having the way that God figured out how to have mercy on all and all of his wisdom that's the depth and the ridges, both of the, uh, the wisdom and knowledge of God and how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. When Calvinists quote this, they jump straight from Romans 9.18 straight to Romans 11.33 without looking at anything in between. And Romans 11.33 is a reference to God having mercy on all, not God hardening people arbitrarily for no reason, never letting them have salvation at all. It's actually the opposite of how Calvinists use it. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath seen his counselor, who hath uh, first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So when he says he's had mercy on all, this is written, present your bodies a living sacrifice, is written in the context of everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, uh, being recipients of God's mercy. Okay? And so don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't think that you're, don't lift yourself up above those who haven't, you know, received and trusted Christ, but think soberly, because that same mercy that was given to you, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So I don't think this measure of faith is just given to those that are among them, but it's a reference back to the fact that it is now the Gentile church's responsibility to minister to everybody and don't do like the Jews and think that you're better than the ones who haven't received, you know, who aren't following God's program or like the Calvinists who think that they're better than everybody else who doesn't have faith and God is, you know, God hates them. Okay. But realize that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith and now it's your responsibility to be the conduit of God's mercy to these people. You are the, you, the church. Instead of Israel, now the church is the spokesman of God to everyone about the love and mercy of God being available to everyone. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up.
looking at some of the comments over here. So this faith that's given to everyone, when Paul was talking to the people in Mars Hill in Athens, he said, among other things, and I'll just jump right to this point for the sake of time, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the fact that Christ is raised from the dead, now that word assurance, if you double click on that in your Bible app, it's going to take you to the Greek word. And the Greek word is pistis. You may recognize that as the word for faith. Okay, that is the word for faith. So if I go to Acts chapter 17, Acts 17, 31, okay, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, like this, and I'm going to go open, I'm going to let you see the Bible app that I'm messing around with. When I click on this word assurance here, y'all see that? Yeah. When I double click on that, look what word pops up. It is pistis. Okay? Persuasion, credence, conviction, and religious truth, truthfulness of God. It's the same word that gets translated as faith. All those times. We right click on this and we want to do some kind of word study. Bam. We can do a word study. At least I thought we could. I don't know if it... Uh, wants me to do a word study right now. I don't want to troubleshoot this program while I'm trying to do a live video though. And you find out that faith, pistis, is by far the majority. This, this blue ring there is the majority. Assurance, belief, belief, fidelity, belief, that same faith that has to be a gift, right? According to the Calvinist misinterpretation of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it's given to everybody. Everybody's got it. And so because of that, because that measure of faith is given to everybody, it's very important that we present our bodies a living sacrifice to God so that, what? So that. The life also of Jesus is made manifest in our mortal fle flesh. Notice we're showing somebody something. Okay? And that's why when we get to Romans chapter 12, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may prove it. That renewing of your mind, coming back through that order, disorder, reorder. You may show, demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for the sake of other people seeing as the embodied gospel so that the people on whom God has had mercy can see Christ in you and perhaps be prompted also to receive Christ just as they should. Now Romans is interesting. This may, if you're a Calvinist, you may want to turn off the video at this point. That uh, Human larva said, uh, what Bible software was that? That was Logos. So if you're a Calvinist and may want to turn off the video, you may find this triggering. Um, not many Calvinists know this, and I'll make this bigger just so you can see this. You can check this out with your own eyes, but um, not many Calvinists know this, but Romans, Romans, the book of Romans, goes past chapter 9. It goes past chapter 9. All right, now if you're offended by that, we have a safe place for you. It's called, uh, maybe you don't want to watch this channel. Click off this channel, go watch something else, okay? Uh, this channel is not for you, and that may offend you, but Romans does. It goes past chapter 9. Actually has 16 chapters in it, which means that there are seven chapters after chapter 9 that Calvinists don't even know are there. But they're there. And, uh, I hate to be the one to break that to you, you know. Maybe it should have been a family member or something like that. But Paul often divides his letters up into something like this. The first portion of his letter, you'd say it's not exactly half all the time, even though in Ephesians it's three chapters and three chapters. 
But the first portion of the letter is usually informational. He's giving you a bunch of information. Here's the mechanics behind how things work, what's going on. Here's the ontology behind what I'm saying, da, 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 da. And then because of that, here's some practical stuff on how you should behave as a result. Now, bearing that in mind, because he starts off in, in Romans chapter 1, says, I'm going to give you the gospel. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. Okay? The gospel is the power of God into salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I found it good to also write, preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. So we think the gospel is like you take people through the Romans road and you know what they do? They have verses that they pull out of chapter 3, chapter 5, and chapter 10. We have chapter 6 too. Chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 10. And they're skipping a whole bunch of stuff. And what we don't realize is that the whole point of the book of Romans, after I tell you informationally what are the mechanics behind the gospel, the whole point is for you to present your body a living sacrifice and embody that gospel and live it out. That's the whole point. And he tells you in chapter 12 very, very specific practical things to do. Chapter 13, very specific practical things to do. Very, chapter 14, very specific dispositionally practical things to do. This whole, whole rest of the book is telling you how to embody the gospel that he just got through telling you the mechanics behind in these other 11 chapters. So we can't leave those off. When he tells you to present your body a living sacrifice, don't just memorize Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, but be very, very familiar with the rest of the book of Romans so that you know how to present your body a living sacrifice. And remember those passages on charity that we read earlier in the video. Where was it? The way, the truth, and the life. Above all, charity. Right there in Romans 13. How do you present your body a living sacrifice? Love is the fulfilling of the law. That's, that's one of the main points he's getting at. Right there. And then chapter 14 is how do we bring people along who don't quite see so clearly yet. Uh, which is probably a chapter I need to spend a lot of time in. Now, I wanted to cover this in the beginning of the chapter, in the beginning of this video, and I just forgot because there's so many slides. But the typically what we say the gospel is, is this over here is, if you go to seminary, get a theology degree, all that stuff, they're going to tell you this is the definition of the gospel. It's essentially the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. And this is the content of the gospel. Well, believeth what? So Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which ye have also received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Then he tells them, keep in memory what? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And I remember he's telling you the gospel. He's declaring the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the content. This is, in a nutshell, the content of the gospel. Okay, And in the book of Romans, Paul really drags this out, not in a bad way, but goes through line-by-line line details of what all this stuff is. And this is the definition of the gospel. So one of the problems in evangelical Christianity, fundamentalism, all that stuff, we, we have this notion that getting people to just be persuaded that the facts of this truth claim are true, that, that that's Christianity. And once we get people to affirm those things, then, oh, they're saved and they're on our team and they can join our church. But that's just the starting point, people. It's just the starting point. Remember, the devils even believe and tremble. This demon-possessed man had no problem understanding who Jesus was. Jesus, thou son of the most high God. And he knew he had power. Okay, and these guys, these demons over here. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are ye? Just getting people to affirm the facts of the gospel. Like we talked about Brian Mossman earlier, who, who uh, 
believed the gospel was true, all the facts of the matter, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was necessary to pay for the sins. He just wasn't ready to receive Christ till after the summer that year, which he did. I don't think he was saved until then. Just my opinion. So <clears throat> this gospel, the point of today's video is that it must be embodied. It must be embodied. Okay, so that Christ, so the life of Christ can be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And we talked about the order, the life, death, resurrection, order, disorder, reorder. Jesus himself says, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, when people, especially dispensationalists, and I have some dispensationalist books right behind me, that's why I'm looking over there. We get this idea that there's this, we, you know, everyone's always trying to systematize and unify the God, you know, the Bible and try to make it some, some unifying theory that makes it non-contradictory. And we get books like this, including this one, this one by Adam Harwood here. And, um, what was I saying? <clears throat> The point that I'm trying to make is that we try to unify, we try to find these theories that make it, make all the claims non-contradictory and everyone pretty much agrees that, you know, Jesus was preaching one thing and Paul seems to be preaching something else. And like Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom and Paul is preaching, you know, the gospel of the grace of God, something like that. That's what the dispensationalists say. And they're all they're trying to find an explanation for why these things seem to contradict and how at a higher level they really don't contradict. But if you look at the gospel as the embodied gospel and then you relook at what Paul is saying and you relook at what Jesus is saying, to me, it doesn't look like there's anything to disambiguate. It doesn't look like there's any disharmony or apparent disharmony between Paul and Jesus that needs to be unified between some kind of, with some kind of theory. That's the problem and the danger of thinking that everything that they're saying must be reduced to propositional beliefs. And that's why you have to try to work things out through covenantal theology and dispensational theology because you're blind and because you can't see. And when I say you, I mean, I was, I was in it for years myself. And all the people who come up with these systems, they're just not seeing from the right perspective. And when you understand that it's the embodied gospel, it starts to make a lot of sense. And it's it looks like the same thing now. Now Jesus is saying, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That sounds a lot like this. It sounds like Jesus and Paul saying the same thing. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. That looks a lot like this. That looks a lot like this. Forgetting those things which are behind. Pressing toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. For what shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore, and you could look at the, uh, at the expense of your authentic self. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adul adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Uh, maybe you'll stay in stage three and will not wake up ever. Mark 10.21 Jesus beholding him, loved him, and saith unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up thy cross and follow me. That doesn't sound like the plan of salvation that we teach in our churches, does it? But it does sound a lot like what Paul describes in Philippians chapter 3. He gave up all that stuff. He gave it all up and counted it as but dung that he may win Christ. If you look at it as the embodied gospel, it looks like it starts to look like the same message rather than just a set of 
you know, propositionally reductive conclusions that people have extracted from the Bible. The embodied gospel makes a lot more sense. And it seems that Jesus and Paul are saying the same thing when you look at it from that perspective. In Matthew 10, 38 through 39, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. For he that findeth his life, the authentic self, shall lose it. Or if you find your ego self, you'll lose your authentic self. And he that loseth his life, your ego self, shall f- for my sake shall find it. What did we see with Paul? He that loseth his life. Pharisee, circumcised the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. He lost all that. And what did he do? He found it. He found it that I may win Christ by counting all that stuff but dung. It's an ego death. We call that an ego death. That is the stuff that your your perceived identity is constructed of, all that stuff that you're enculturated with, and all your human accomplishments. That has to die. And then you win Christ. And it looks like Jesus is saying exactly the same thing that Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 4, in 2 Corinthians 2, in Philippians chapter 3, in Romans chapter 12. Do you see the pattern? How have we missed this? How have we missed this in our churches so much? We miss it so much. Acts 14.22, confirming the souls of the disciples. This is Paul going around confirming the souls of the disciples with Barnabas and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Well, that doesn't really sound like the plan of salvation from a fundamentalist evangelical sense. But if you understand that every time, you know, the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17.21, Every time you go through order, disorder, reorder, you can perceive more clearly the kingdom of God that you're already in. But it is that tribulation, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, experience, tribulation, those kinds of things, when attended to properly with the right disposition, allow us to enable us to realize and see more clearly the kingdom of God that we are already in. Okay? It's very clear. So when you look at this from a fundamentalist standpoint, it looks like Paul is trying to preach some kind of effort-based or works-based salvation to get into the kingdom of God. But when you understand it from a non-dual awareness and from the embodied gospel, it matches exactly what Jesus is saying. It's all a matter of perspective. And the the dispensationalists, they all think that Paul and Jesus are trying to say two different things because they got the wrong perspective. They're down here. They're down here at the propositional level trying to sort things out down to all the propositions. And that's why they miss the message. They miss the message. It's been sitting there the whole time. Kayla has a super chat. So thank you, Kayla, for the super chat. Kayla says, Happy Thanksgiving. How do you view unbelief in light of the, this perspective of belief? Lack of charity for self and others. Dissociation from reality. Thanks. Uh, thanks as always. Okay. And so it depends on what you mean by unbelief. Okay. If you're talking about someone who has professed Christ who is not living the embodied gospel or even trying to. We see over in Romans chapter 5. It says, and I have to go to different monitors and find my mouse again. It says in Romans chapter 5, By whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God, and not only so, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing, so what we were talking about a few minutes ago, there's the tribulation and the patience and experience and hope and the love of God. It's all right there. And there is an element that is accessed by faith. Okay? 
Now, we think faith is believing some truth claims, but when we look at the biblical picture of faith, <clears throat> we see that through faith, without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And Jesus says, Seek, ask, and ye shall uh, receive, seek, and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. In Matthew chapter 7, there's a diligent seeking component to this. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. There was some, uh, Noah had to have this order, disorder, reorder. The, the whole world was disordered around Noah before he could have the resurrection cycle of rebirthing the human race. Abraham has this very interesting place where he is uh, willing to sacrifice Isaac. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. That's interesting. It kind of sounds like Abraham received Christ in a figure. There's no place in the Old Testament that says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. No place in the Old Testament that says that. And this description from Hebrews 11 about Abraham in the book of Genesis is really the closest it gets. And that is before the law, not under the law, which is very interesting. So am I just talking in circles? What I'm trying to steer clear of is the ontology okay if we're talking about uh how do we view unbelief in the light of the perspective of belief okay um the obvious and clear answer is that what the bible means by belief without what the bible says by belief yeah you don't enter into the grace But I also think that when some people, like when Paul Maxwell and Tyler Vela and Megan Phelps, when they are rejecting what they call Christianity and what they call Jesus and they're no longer Christian, I actually don't think they're rejecting the biblical Jesus. I, I don't think they ever believe the biblical Jesus and they're rejecting the idolatry that they should reject for the same reason that I rejected it. And they might actually be closer to the biblical Jesus than they ever were. See? I think there's a lot of idolatry going on in the name of Jesus right now in the Western church. And there are some people that, um, let's go back to the Bible. Some very interesting things here. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What does it mean if they don't ask? What if they don't seek? What if they don't knock? What if they're like Noah and they don't build the ark? You see? There's a, there's a participatory component here. And uh, for those who, without place, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Think of God and, and the in the Alfred North Whitehead, or maybe in a Spinoza sense, or in a uh, in the dramatic sense, or in the sense of uh, the the ground of being, okay, the flow of reality, the river the, of that of all that which is real, okay. It's impossible to please. It's impossible to do anything. It's impossible to uh, build a company that makes cars without faith. Like for, say, Elon Musk to have done what he's done with Tesla and SpaceX. It's impossible for him to do any of that without faith and moving forward just like the people in Hebrews 11. Well, you say, well, he's doing that for earthly things, not for heavenly things, that sort of thing. If we keep going in Matthew, we find, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
but he which doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, they will pay lip service. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name we've cast out devils. In thy name we've done many wonderful works. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, he that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever confesses the name of Jesus, it's not what it says. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and his house, uh, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. The rain descended, and, it, and et etc. and so forth. I think we know the story. The wise man built his house upon the rock, right? So interestingly, there are people that I know right now who <coughs> I think that there could be some people who are following the biblical Jesus, but are rejecting the idolatrous Jesus of Western fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, and rightly so. And they're following Jesus by action, even though they don't have the phonemes in the English language of Jesus Christ coming out of their mouth, they're still, you know, neither is there any, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. A Jesus, uh, the name of Jesus is Jehovah is salvation or the ground of being is salvation. The ground of being is that which salvages everything. That is unavoidable regardless of what phonemes or phonemes come out of people's mouths and the fundamentalist tends to think that having the right propositions come out of the mouth is what saves the person and it seems to me from experience and from scripture that following jesus believing in jesus is not reducible to correct phonemes and I have been rethinking, back to this question here that Kayla asked, I have been rethinking exactly what it means to believe in Christ based on this, based on separating from the idolatrous version of Jesus that I was raised with and you know, seeking, knocking, and asking the biblical Jesus to the best of our ability and, and walking by faith, not by sight, toward the building of the ark or receiving him in a figure or what, you know, the things like in Hebrews 11, things as people did. There's something like that. Now, some people are going to hear this. They're going to try to say, oh, I'm preaching work salvation. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. So I don't know if I answered this question. Lack of charity for self and others, dissociation from reality. I think that people should, I think that fundamentalists, evangelical Christianity is dissociation from reality. But yeah, the, the questions you ask, Kayla, are like uh, stay up till two in the morning questions. <laughs> They're good questions, good questions, and I appreciate you asking them. Uh, this will probably be a good FSI discussion. We might have an FSI session where we just throw this question out uh, as the prompt to start the discussion on Wednesday night. So I'm not sure how this Wednesday night is going to go because of Thanksgiving and all that. What other questions do we have? This is uh, Kurt from FSI. This is a nice video. Is he saying he's Kurt? I didn't know he was Kurt. But uh, I just learned something. There's Yeah, belief is not what you think. That's the name of one of our videos that we highly recommend people watch. How do you live day to day? A practically them in easy America after you have died to your ego? Yeah, that's a really good question. All the people in Hebrews 11 had lives full of bad choices, but they were Old Testament. It's, you know what's funny if you look at the people in the Old Testament is that if you read the Old Testament, they're all doing uh, crazy, wonderful things. And then they it kind of gets uh, kind of gets whitewashed in the New Testament. Like Paul, I think right there, in Hebrews 11, you know, accepted in faith, nothing wavering. You really? 
I mean, Abraham went and tried out Hagar before he trusted God with Sarah. And then when Sarah found out she was going to have a baby, she laughed. You don't, you don't read about that in the New Testament. That's how it went down, though. They did kind of waver. <laughs> yes, I'm Kurt. The jig is up. That's funny. Uh, thanks, Forging Beyond Belief, for the uh, confidence, the uh, compliment and all that. Seraphim says, $2 per show for every mention of non-duality. Really? So if I could just keep saying non-duality. <laughs> <clears throat> all right so um i think roberta said something too hey there yeah it's good to see some of you guys unbelief to me is not doing the way of christ that's it's very interesting and that's so i think that's worth saying as well that if you go back to the way that is christ unbelief is uh not even attempting to walk or be in attunement with the flow of that way Well, to everyone in the chat, uh, thanks for the super chats, Seraphim and Kayla. To everyone in the chat, thanks for chatting. To everyone who has been uh, watching, thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel, the details to do so are in the description below. If you want to see more content like this, we appreciate that. And uh, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.